Section One of Scenes of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Scenes in Europe for the Amusement and Instruction of Little Tarriet Home Travellers by Isaac Taylor. Introduction masters and missus come draw up your chair safely here by the warm fireside for your entertainment a kind father's cares both knowledge and innocent pleasure provide we live in england the better for us those who have seen other countries can tell many a nation is dreadfully worse none can old england for ever excel you shall soon know what great travellers see safe by the table all snug as you sit none but a dunce will quite ignorant be if at a book he can easily get here you may travel o'er cold northern snows see them catch whales or the white growling bear better than do it yourself i suppose they might catch you if they once got you there would your rough fur-clad russian be trampling on snows through his fair blackened land would you live under the turk nay then see what a long beard you must dangle in hand would you to spot a step over to france cry parlez vous with a cringing monsieur get out your fiddle then caper and dance wear wooden shoes and pigtail my dear grave see the spanish don long sword and cloak he is an hidalgo a gentleman born and says the left an estate what a joke he was not he has not found it so looks quite forlorn would little missy go follow the plough over to sweden we'll send you a trip be frenchman's madame or hollander's vrow you'd want to come back with a hop step and skip so be but contented and love to be good learn all your lessons and do as your bid keep from what's vulgar or silly or rude be thankful for kindness and grieve if you're cheered many a book then to open your mind if you will read shall be readily found books full of pictures if you are inclined all neatly printed and lettered and bound january eighteen nineteen end of section one Section 2 of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Scenes in Europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor chapter two england going out one leaving his native home so fare thee well harry the fond mother cries god's blessing preserve thee my boy let's hope he'll return soon with tears in his eyes his father half choked with his feelings replies and then says his sister have done with our sighs we'll give a full vent to our joys good-bye to you all there once more all adieu says harry resolved to look bold so he strided away while his feet brushed the dew with his trousers so smart a white stripe and a blue his shirt's in a bundle, all handsome and new, And his heart, too, as full as could hold. For Harry loved home and his father's fireside. From a child it had been his delight. Round the tall elm he played, or he climbed it with pride. Dear was the white steeple, seen many miles wide. He takes his last look with his head half aside, Then sinks in the vale out of sight two going aboard ship that is the ship waterman the good ship hope of london 
Tom Bowline, commander. Do you see how she floats? There is not a prettier vessel in all the port, and there are a great many of them, too. London looks as if it stood in a wood. And so good-bye to you the tower, and London Bridge, and the monument, and all ye good folks. I shan't see you again for many a day. But then you won't for many a day see me either, and so we're even. Now, my lads, skip up her sides and aboard in a minute. Come, hand us up my great box. I must not go without that, you know. Huzzah! Here it is. 3. Johnny Groat's House This is proverbially the most remote habitation in Scotland. But there is Johnny himself. What does he say? Bleak the surly north wind blows, bringing hail and frost and snows. But I scorn his fiercest ire when I rouse my heathy fire. Hark the sea fowl's ceaseless cries, screaming harsh their lullabies. Every hole a village teems, every crag a nation seems. Thousands skim or rest in flocks, all alive the massy rocks. Seared they start, wheel to and fro, like a black cloud hovering low. Scared at me? Nay, take your rest, you have yours, and I my nest. Vast my prospect through the scene, ocean rolls his waters green, till in purple tints they die, till they meet the bending sky. Not the sameness varies save, a cloud comes playing o'er the wave, or a sail will catch the light in the horizon sparkling bright. Yet, though lonely is the spot, dear his home to Johnny Groat. The history of the Groat family is interesting, and I will therefore relate it to you. John de Groat, with his brothers, it is supposed originally came from Holland, and took up their residence in this remote part. In process of time, the family of the Groats had increased, and there came to be eight different proprietors of that name who possessed the estate amongst them. These eight families, having lived peaceably for a number of years, established an annual meeting to celebrate the day on which their ancestors arrived on that coast. On one of these occasions, a dispute arose respecting the privilege of sitting at the head of the table, and other trivial matters, which might probably have proved fatal and its consequences, had not John de Grote interposed. He pictured the happiness they had had hitherto enjoyed, and said, if they began to divide and quarrel, their neighbors would take their property and expel them from the country. He proposed to build a house in such a form that every man should consider himself master. This would prevent disputes at their annual meetings. They separated, and in due time he built a room apart from the house, of an octagon shape, with a door and a window in each of the eight sides, and a table in the middle of the same form. At the next meeting he desired each of them to enter at his own door, and sit at the head of the table, himself taking the seat that was left unoccupied. By this contrivance, any dispute with regard to rank was prevented, and their former harmony and good humor restored. End of section two. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section three of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Scenes in Europe, for the amusement and instruction of little tarry-at-home travellers, by Isaac Taylor. Icy Sea. 4. Catching Whales. See the floundering bulky whale, giant of the polar seas, who shall dare his strength assail, 
who disturbed his mighty ease now a cataract spouting high playful through his way is seen sparkling in the clear blue sky foaming white o'er waves so green sure the mark the boatmen's guide stout they will pull the bending oar near his blackened form they glide fling the harpoon then spouts the gore deep beneath his blubber skin fast its hold the iron keeps pained he dives and hopes to win safety in his native deeps vain the hope the purple tide opened by the unerring dart gushes from his wounded side drains at length his fluttering heart struggling fainter see he floats now they win the unwieldy prize fast around him ply the boats with a thundering groan he dies the water to the north of europe and iceland is called the icy sea and is famous for whale fishery the ships proper for this kind of commerce are allowed to be those of a moderate size and are generally stored with six months provision and manned with about fifty men and boys when arrived at the spot where the whales are expected a sailor is stationed at the masthead and as soon as he discovers one of these enormous animals the rest of the crew hoists out their boat and rows to the place where he directs the harpooner stands at the prow of the boat with a harpoon ready for striking in his hand to which is fastened a cord of considerable length which runs over a swivel at the edge of the boat as soon as he arrives within reach of the animal he darts the harpoon into its sides it is some moments before the creature becomes sensible of the wound but as the harpoon penetrates it begins to feel the most agonizing pain and instantly dives in hopes of escaping the attack of its foe want of air again brings it towards the surface he is wounded again and becoming exhausted expires the poor whale is then cut into pieces and proper means adopted for extracting the oil which is brought home to england and serves to light our streets and for many other purposes five fields of ice the more northerly we go the colder it is so that in the farther parts of the whole ocean is covered with ice and all the land with snow there are scarcely any spots habitable yet great endeavours have been made to penetrate through those seas in summer-time and sail under the pole and so on into the pacific ocean straight to china on one side and peru on the other but all attempts have been in vain the last were made by lord mulgrave when the ships were frozen in for ten days being surrounded on all sides with vast fields of ice farther than the eye could see the ice is from fifty to two hundred feet above water and nine times as much is below water as appears above in many places the winds and waves heap up these vast masses of ice one upon another to the height of several hundred feet when the fields of ice separate the cracking noise is like thunder it was a joyful sound however to his seamen who had begun to drag a vessel over the ice for miles in order to reach the open sea by the wind changing the ice was all gone in a few hours and the ships were set at liberty six iceland iceland is an island in this northern sea and one of the farthest that is inhabited called as this region is a volcano spouting out fire is found there called mount hecla this is on the southern part of the island it rises to the height of about five thousand feet it has often sent forth flames and sometimes the burning lava has covered and ruined great tracts of land it is remarkable that while flames issue from a vast chasm in the mountain the snow which covers its sides is not melted at the foot of the mountain and no doubt connected with the internal fire there are several places whence every now and then columns of boiling water are cast out sometimes to the height of sixty or even ninety feet there are also many lesser openings where the boiling water issues with a more regular stream over these the inhabitants suspend a kettle and boil their provision no bellows to blow no fuel to find 
no fire to see nor poker to mind i yet boil my dinner and feed all my party come taste if you doubt it you're welcome right hearty end of section three section four of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine g scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarot home travellers by isaac taylor norway seven the fox catching crabs norway is a mountainous wild country covered with vast forests of fir great quantities of which are cut down every year and exported especially to england where it is called deal and is used in every sort of carpentry work it is to the shores of norway too that we send in the proper season to purchase vast quantities of lobsters which are found on the coast in great shoals you see the boats fishing for them in the distance herrings in vast numbers too come from under the ice about the north pole and dividing into separate bodies supply the baltic and britain on both sides and hundred and fifty thousand fishermen are maintained by the herrings on the coast of norway only so you master fox you think you can nab a tit-bit for supper a silly young crab so you let him bite fast on the point of your tail then give him a jerk and to catch him ne'er fail little crab thinks he catches a fox i dare say so he does to his cost for his life he will pay i wish all the young and the silly and such would learn to be cautious nor aim at too much eight recovering the lost sheep in a country so mountainous as norway there are many precipices among the broken rocks vast waterfalls roar and tumble from the mountain tops into the craggy vale below the scenery is of the grandest and most astonishing kind such as makes the traveller stand aghast especially when he finds he must cross deep ravines on a single plank tottering with his weight and by its height above the roaring torrent making him giddy it often happens that a sheep strays from the fold and tumbles a vast way down sometimes it lodges on some projecting point of the rock where it has scarcely room to stand when its owner discovers it he bestrides a stick fastened to a rope and causes himself to be let down at the hazard of breaking his own neck till he can reach the straggler which he fastens to his own cord and then both are drawn up together to a place of safety little lambkin silly ranger keep your pastures safe and sure rambling only leads to danger such as you can ne'er endure friendly is the hand extended hazarding his life for thine straying souls are thus befriended by the shepherd's grace divine nine the whirlpool of maelstrom the waters of the ocean when the tide rises or falls passing the deep hollow whirl round and round with great rapidity and with a violence which draws in vessels even from six miles distance if once they come within the influence of this eddying stream they insensibly glide into the middle of it and are dashed to pieces against the rocks without any possibility of escaping hark it is the seaman's shriek shuddering mid the whirling wave england's navy were too weak one poor eddying bark to save ah could mother sister hear as around their fire they smile wife or prattling children dare who the tedious hours beguile but no tidings e'er shall come swallowed in the deep maelstrom End of section four Section five of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brontosaurus. Scenes in Europe 
for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor lapland part ten lapland witch selling a wind it is something to have escaped the whirlpool by keeping quite out of its reach and to find oneself on firm ground but where are we now in lapland why this is not like england at all how short the men are and all clothed in skins and the women too one can hardly tell one from the other but they seem very happy i should not wonder if they love their mountains and their huts and their reindeer as well as we do our green fields and white cottages our cows and our horses and our farmyards well so much the better for them may we go into their houses i suppose so if we knock at the door and behave civilly but there is no door nor chimney only this narrow hole for us to creep in and the smoke to creep out well and the inside is all lined with skins warm enough and there's a fire in the middle and places parted off with skins all round for several families to have each their own room jack frost may whistle outdoors if he pleases but he can hardly get his nose in here but what has that old woman got a string full of knots and she tells the captain that if he unties them as she bids him he shall have whatever wind he wishes for and he is fool enough to believe her and is giving her money for it what a silly set all round well let me rejoice that i have been better taught i can read my bible and know therefore that god sends wind and rain snow or sunshine to fulfil his word part eleven travelling with a sledge drawn by reindeer gee ho a pretty pace too ambling and trotting and so you can go thirty or forty miles without stopping can you now it seems the reindeer serves the laplanders instead of horse and cow and sheep he carries their burdens draws their travelling sledges the milk finds them in drink and in cheese the skins make their clothes and cover their tents the flesh is eaten and the sinews make bowstrings and thread for sewing yet he lives on only a little moss which he digs with his foot from under the snow though they ramble about yet at the sound of a horn they will come home part twelve north cape on europe's utmost northern point i stand where boundless spreads the ocean foaming round beyond me to the arctic pole no land no habitation verdure life is found here desolation holds his frozen throne winter with magic wand the palace rears the obedient wave becomes translucent stone while rich with icicle the work appears ye rocks all wild and rough of size sublime unchanged since first the almighty flung ye here terrific barren vast defying time the mind o'erwhelmed appalled recoils with fear such need ye be your stormy place to hold rich pasture mould weak barrier soon would cease guardians of europe yea like warriors bold defend the lovelier vales which smile in peace here dash the waves like mountains rolling on as if at once to sweep the rock away the giant rock the effort spurns tis gone the roar the eddy and the foaming spray yet here the summer's sun shall linger bright the horizon's blazing edge skim round and round one day of months conjoined and then one night ceaseless and dreary marks each annual bound yet here the moon her burnished lamp shall shew with mimic daylight blazon night's dull face 
cheer ebon darkness to a milder hue and give to arctic snows a lovely grace yet here the aurora through the north shall blaze with streaming light to cheer the traveller's way the playful brilliant oscillating rays shall light up night to cheerful holiday end of section five section six of scenes in europe this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Scenes in Europe for the Amusement and Instruction of Little Tarry at Home Travelers by Isaac Taylor. Chapter 6 sweden thirteen gustavus vaza rousing the dalecarlians sweden is one of the most northern nations of europe the gulf of bothnia runs up it and almost divides it into two from these parts issued a barbarian horde who at length overran and subverted the roman empire Sweden, however, was little known among the nations for many ages. In the fourteenth century, about the time of our Richard the Second, Margaret reigned over Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. But Christian the Second, King of Denmark, in order to make himself absolute in Sweden, massacred all the principal nobility of the country, and tyrannized dreadfully over the people. Gustavus Vasa a prince who escaped his fury hid himself as a peasant and worked in the mines among the mountains of dalecarlia at length he determined to rid his country of this foreign yoke and by his courage and eloquence roused the peasants of the mountains to deliver themselves and sweden from the danish bondage he was successful and the swedes in gratitude elected him king to arms ye brave swedes drive your tyrants away nor tamely submit to a foreigner's sway don't they rob us insult us and murder us all if we must die in battle let us gloriously fall without liberty life is a burden be free every briton huzzas britons love liberty fourteen women at plough there is something in this which an Englishman does not like. How strange it would appear if our farmers sent their wives or daughters to plough, while they were enjoying their pipe at home. This would be very cruel, and only to be excused by great poverty, which obliges all to labor for the common necessaries of life. Not that women ought to be idle. Idleness is a disgrace to any rational creature and a great calamity to the rich as well as to the poor but there are lesser labors more suitable to them the cares of the family cooking needlework and all the comforts of a poor man's cottage may well employ the woman without sending her to plough making her thresh the corn row on the water wait upon the bricklayers carry burdens and do all the drudgery most laborious but so they do in sweden Look at England's cottage maiden, healthy, clean, can sew and read. See her bring the new-laid eggs in, milk the cow, the poultry feed. Neath the oak she plies her knitting, whirls the wheel, or sews the patch. These are occupations fitting, these adorn her roof of thatch. Grown, become a wife and mother, home her little kingdom is. Realm of comforts wants no other sees her husband's children's bliss fifteen punishing a cruel boy in travelling through foreign countries we sometimes meet with what displeases us but sometimes too we find what has our hearty approbation the punishing a boy who had been cruel to a poor dog cannot but rejoice us he who can ill-treat a dog a cat a horse a donkey 
or indeed any dumb creature shews a bad disposition such a one would torment a sister or ill-treat an old father or even murder any one he took an ill will against if it were not for fear of being hanged such cruel dispositions ought to be checked to be punished as soon as they appear End of section six recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section seven of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor russia sixteen the imperial winter palace at petersburg russia is indeed a vast empire even that part of it which lies in europe russia was however very little known till the reign of peter the great who lived at the same time with our william the third peter himself was a man of great mind he found himself ruler of a horde of barbarians and although at that time he was as ignorant as any of them yet he resolved to improve himself in order that he might be able to mould and polish his empire with this intention he laid aside his dignity and travelled privately into foreign countries where he observed their laws and manners in england it is said he worked as a shipwright in the dockyard at deptford and imposed upon himself many privations in order to attain knowledge as the seat of dominion had usually been at moscow the russians had scarcely any intercourse with other nations he was determined to come nearer to the civilized world and resolved to build a city for the seat of this empire which should have access to the sea he therefore founded what is now called petersburg and obliged all his nobility to build themselves sumptuous palaces there and there attend upon him as there he would hold his court very rapid was the growth of this new city all his successors have displayed their grandeur in it and thus in the north amid wilds and lakes and morasses has a new and grand capital of the russian empire sprung up one of the grandest buildings is this imperial palace built of granite and marble containing forty rooms on a floor a magnificent building but in a heavy style of architecture the actions of this great man offer a useful lesson to those who are idle and continually thinking things too difficult and beyond their understanding which only require industry to attain seventeen russian peasants and sledges the russian peasants are very hardy but rough and unpolished their winter dress is sheepskin with the woolly side inwards this reaches to the knee and is bound round the waist by a sash they wrap a flannel round the leg instead of stockings wear a high fur cap and four sandals weave strips of the bark of a tree tied by strings of the same nature most of their burdens are drawn upon sledges which have no wheels but slide over the snow sometimes they are drawn by a peasant who thus conveys his goods to market sometimes by a horse in summer time instead of sledges they use a low carriage on four wheels drawn by a horse called from its jolting a drojeka the russians love to drive very fast in the busy streets of petersburg vast numbers of sledges are seen driving in all directions yet they are so expert that accidents seldom happen eighteen market of frozen animals the cold in the northern parts of russia is far beyond our conception here in england nothing is more common than for the drivers when sitting for hire unemployed to be frozen to death incautious people often have the nose frozen and especially the ear in which case it is absolutely necessary to rub the part with snow to bring the circulation on again very gently should a person instead of this apply warm water or bring the part to the fire it would instantly mortify and drop off many people have had their faces frostbitten the place heals with a scar as if burnt with a hot iron this intense cold has one advantage animals slain 
and properly frozen may be conveyed from any distance and preserved for months these are brought to the city and a market is formed on the river neva which is frozen over in the beginning of january and which lasts for three days it is a curious sight a sort of street is made on the river a mile long where frozen animals are exposed to sale whole carcasses raw of oxen sheep hogs geese fowls and game of all sorts standing upright in groups and circles or hanging in festoons end of section seven section eight of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor russia two nineteen the emperor travelling the frost and snow to afford great conveniences for travelling very long journeys are thus performed with ease and expedition their carriages are sledges which slide over the snow these are warm being well lined with felt sometimes they are drawn by reindeer as in lapland and sometimes by horses as soon as the snow is hard enough to bear them by continual travelling from town to town in the same track a sort of road is well beaten over the snow and it becomes in a few weeks smooth and proper to pass over so that the traveller lies at his ease wrapped up in furs bidding defiance to the cold the emperor when he travels has a sort of small house large enough to hold a bed a table etc so that half a dozen people may be accommodated in it this is drawn by a number of horses if he travels in the night they set on fire large heaps of wood which are placed on the sides of the track and give him light twenty ice hills little boys who cry at the cold and can only sit by the fire all day here in england are ready to think that in russia nobody will stir out who can help it all the winter long but going out and taking hearty exercise is much better than sitting by the fire at any time and the russians go out on purpose to play one principal mode of their amusement consists of their hills of ice which they build on purpose making a framework of timber thirty feet high ascending at one end by a ladder and sloping down at the other this frame is covered with lumps of ice squared neatly and laid true like a pavement of stones over this they pour water which soon freezes and makes one compact body of ice everywhere at the top of this is a handsome sledge like a small boat or butcher's tray the person gets into this and is put at the edge of the slope down this he slides with such force as to carry him a great way on the flat ice of the river on which this hill of ice is built he then comes to another ice hill which he ascends and slides down as before and so on again one after another sometimes boys will skate down these places on one leg keeping their balance with great adroitness twenty one statue of peter the great this is a grand work the statue is of bronze admirable in all its parts cast by monsieur falconet a great statuary it is placed on the top of a real rock of granite which after six months immense labor was brought eight miles and placed in petersburg on purpose to receive this statue so the great monarch peter's mighty mind rose and attained a towering height sublime a brutal nation by degrees refined no rocky steep like this so hard to climb he saw what laws were wanted and ordained brought nobles princes nations from afar persuaded punished showed them how and reigned or all his hordes renewed their mighty czar end of section eight section nine of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers 
by isaac taylor russia three twenty two russian bride the custom among the common people in russia in respect to marriage is for a young man who intends to enter into that state to apply to the parents of his intended bride for their consent if gained he sends her a present sometimes of a comb paint and patches or any similar trifles when he is allowed to visit her they exchange rings and promise to marry on a certain day from that time until the wedding the girls of her acquaintance by turns attend her and lament her loss in mournful songs on the morning appointed for the marriage her companions take leave of her with many tears and give her to the relations of her intended husband they receive her and her pittance of fortune at the same time which perhaps may consist of a bed a table and a picture of her favorite saint formerly the bride used to present her husband with a knotted whip with which to chastise her and likewise as a token of her obedience to him but i hope the enlightened alexander who has visited england and imbibed more liberal ideas has banished from his country such slavish submission twenty three the cossack the cossacks who were so much the terror of bonaparte and his army in their retreat from moscow were originally polish peasants and served in the ukraine as a militia against the tartars being oppressed by their lords they removed to the banks of the rivers don and tanais and there established a colony they were soon joined by numbers of their countrymen and after reducing the city of asaf to ashes they put themselves under the protection of the russians built circaska on an island in the don and soon increased their possessions on both sides the river they serve in war in consideration of enjoying their liberty very few of them are tall but they are generally well made and have a sprightly and agreeable air those who have not seen their achievements may for a moment perhaps hesitate to credit their superiority in cavalry attacks but what body armed with sabres can resist a lance projecting above six feet beyond the horse's head sustained by the firmest wrist and impelled with the activity of a racehorse it is not the first time the cossack is armed with a lance when he proceeds to war or when he attains to manhood it is the toy of his infancy and the constant exercise of his youth so that he wields it although from fourteen to eighteen feet in length with the address and freedom that the best swordsman in europe would use his weapon wild and untamable agile and free fierce in pursuit of the enemy he nothing can stop his all ravaging course which do you speak of the master or horse twenty four moscow while bonaparte was emperor of the french his insatiable ambition urged him to make an attack upon russia with three hundred thousand men he passed across germany and penetrated to moscow then the russians in order to prevent his settling there set the city on fire in every place so that he only entered upon heaps of smoking ruins this obliged him to return the snow set in cold and hunger as the whole country was devastated destroyed his army in this forlorn condition the troops of russia closed round him in various quarters so that with great difficulty he escaped with scarcely fifty thousand of his troops this sacrificing of moscow saved the whole russian empire moscow was too hot to hold so the french forsook it but the country also cold flesh and blood can't brook it barren all the country round for the people fled it yet were troops in thousands found well might frenchmen dread it hot and cold were equal foes what could bony do sir do why run away he chose what did ye think should you sir he would rush alike full well could he but have got it fighting freezing starving tell he indeed had not it end of section nine section ten of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit 
dot org recording by greg giordano scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor chapter ten turkey twenty five constantinople now we have given a good jump and have got into turkey where the men wear long beards and whiskers and petticoats like women well if they like it so let them but where is constantinople why there on the eastern edge of europe just where it touches asia under the black sea the roman emperor constantine built a city there and called it by his own name he thought that place more convenient for the seat of government than rome because it was nearer the eastern provinces by so doing however he eventually split the empire into two parts the eastern and the western of which rome was still the capital in the eastern part the empire existed for many years after its western division was overthrown but growing weak by this division and weaker still by luxury and effeminate indulgence becoming too luxurious to fight their own battles the troops which they hired to defend the empire at last conquered their feeble masters and the turks now reign over provinces and cities where once the roman glory was at its height the grand seigneur is one of the titles for he has many of the turkish emperor the appropriate sign or ornament is the crescent or new moon he is despotic and his will is law but as in all despotic countries his soldiers really rule and they take the liberty sometimes to strangle the sultan when he is out of favor and place another prince on a throne constantinople is a very large city many of the old roman edifices remain and many beautiful specimens are destroyed as the turks though magnificent have no taste or knowledge twenty six the mosque when the turks conquered the eastern roman empire they brought with them their religion which regards mohammed as the great prophet from god who they say was sent to spread religion by the sword accordingly wherever he came he put every one to death who would not receive him and his religion as coming from god the buildings where these mohammedans met for prayers are called mosques they are usually covered with a dome surmounted with a crescent and ornamented on each side with tall towers called minarets in a gallery about halfway up the minaret stands the mullah who is an officer appointed to call the people to prayers as the turks have a strange dislike to bells or fair arabia's spicy plains by foul mohammed's flag unfurled despotic superstition reigns clanking aloft her mental chains affrighting blinding half the abject eastern world as spreads the mountain torrent wide with dreadful desolating course so bursting forth on every side urged by ambition lust and pride the bloody prophet strides with overwhelming force so was the beauteous east despoiled of nature's gifts of arts renowned her shady groves her mountains wild her fans are thrown in ruins piled or cleared to let his mosque profane the hallowed ground aloft the gilded crescent now where once the cross triumphant rears blind ignorance bids her vetteries bow repeat the koran breathe the vow or vainly pray to one who neither sees nor hears the turk's own mind example gives of what such superstition breeds debased luxurious proud he lives despises knowledge and believes his sword his harem all he now or ever needs twenty seven greek ladies turkey in europe is the very country of the ancient greeks 
many descended from them live intermingled among the turks and in deplorable subjection to them their persons and customs and religion are however very different and present an interesting spectacle to the intelligent traveller greek ladies are very fond of jewels and dress in all their finery even when not about to see company they love to sit on a sofa and be fanned by their slaves the young ladies when they meet they hold of each other's ears with both hands and kiss not the lips but the eyes oh papa do look at this see how odd these ladies kiss when you kiss me i should fear were you thus to pull my ear end of section ten recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section eleven of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Scenes in Europe for the Amusement and Instruction of Little Tarry at Home Travelers by Isaac Taylor. Chapter 11 Greece. 28. Athens. In that small southern part of Turkey, which is almost separated into an island, dwelt the several nations of the ancient Greeks whose poetry, history, and deeds of arts and arms, whose politics and science, exhibit to this day the most interesting specimen of human exertion. While nations who occupied large portions of the earth are sunk in oblivion, mind, intellect, by its wonderful energies, contrived to make this little spot famous throughout the civilized world. Not to know something of Grecian history, is to be ignorant indeed for polite learning and for arts and arms athens rose above its neighbors philosophers heroes artists men worthy of such names whose works are to this day the standard of beauty and sublimity buildings which have astonished beholders for twenty-five hundred years and writings on every subject emanating from hence spread the benign influence of knowledge taste and genius far and wide fallen as athens is every chip of her stones is valuable every relic of ancient mind is precious to those who have knowledge and taste enough to understand wherein true excellence consists spirit of athens hovering near among thine echoing ruins drear whose vast remains in form sublime defiance scowl on mouldering time lift thy dejected head awhile rekindle thy enchanting smile rouse long-lost feelings and retrace the energies of ancient days thy dream of grandeur when thy soul disdained the despot's least control when liberty her bounties wild shed sweet on every free-born child and arts and arms and science grew and academus gardens knew whate'er delights exalts refines or rouses intellect reclines thy sinking head again too late for hope resistless is thy fate twenty nine thermopylae much of the animating history of greece relates to the heroic resistance against the persians who attacked them repeatedly xerxes came at one time with more than a million of men like a flood overflowing but his army before it could reach the heart of greece had to go through a very narrow spot called the pass of thermopylae here leonidas king of sparta with only three hundred of his men resisted and for three days defended the place against that immense army every one lost his life rather than yield they were at last by treachery overcome 
the brave will love the brave and deep revere let britain's honor with a brother's tear that king of freedom and his spartan band who nobly fought to save their native land no lust of conquest urged them to invade they fought the invader and they felt betrayed should foemen fill our country with alarms think of thermopylae and rouse to arms thirty colossus of rhodes this was a gigantic brazen statue of apollo which was made to stride across the mouth of the harbor between its legs the vessels passed in full sail it held in its hand a light to guide mariners in the dark it fell by an earthquake two hundred and twenty-four years before christ the brass when cut to pieces loaded nine hundred camels to take it away it was one hundred and thirty-five feet high and had with inside a winding staircase which led to the top it laid in ruin eight hundred and ninety-four years when the saracens took roads they sold it it was esteemed one of the seven wonders of the world End of section eleven. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section twelve of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Scenes in Europe For the Amusement and Instruction of Little Tarry-at-Home Travelers by Isaac Taylor Chapter 12 Archipelago 31 Island of Sio or Chios between turkey and asia minor is a large sea full of islands many of which were famous in history this sea has been the scene of great exploits by the naval commanders among the greeks in times of war and the principal means of their intercourse with the eastern nations in times of peace the isle of samos is famous for having been the birthplace of pythagoras a great philosopher Patmos is that to which the Apostle John was banished, and where he saw and wrote the revelations. Paros, eminent for the whiteness of its marble, of which some buildings and many of its finest statues were made. Sio, or Chios, is one of the largest islands, and is still remarkable for the beauty of the Greek girls who inhabit it, the finest forms which the painters and statuaries of old took their models they are seen employed in needlework sitting at their windows and doors in this island too was born homer the prince of poets the inhabitants still show an old square house which they say was his thirty two grecian wedding the modern greeks have certain ceremonies which take place at their marriages remarkable only for folly and absurdity numerous attendants and music are always to be found on these occasions the bride covered with a red veil and profusely adorned proceeds with solemn pace supported by her female friends and relations the splendid torch of hymen still maintains its place among the modern greeks it blazes in their processions and if by any accident it should be extinguished these silly people are frightened and think they shall be unfortunate for the remainder of their lives. 33. The Consecrated Fountain The veneration for caverns, groves, and fountains still remains a feature in the Grecian character. In this, although Christianity has been engrafted upon their old superstition, on festival days they will assemble in great numbers to drink the waters of some certain spring reported to be effectual in the cure of diseases or in securing of happiness many trinkets are hung around as testimonies of gratitude for benefits supposed 
to be so received. End of Section 12 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section number 13 of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Scenes in Europe for the Amusement and Instruction of the Little Terry at Home Travelers by isaac taylor italy one thirty four mount etna this burning mountain is not in italy properly so called but in the island of sicily which lies at the foot of italy and apparently once joined it in fact as it has done much in intimate connection it is now a principal part of the king of naples dominions it is thirty miles from the bottom of this mountain to the top the lower part is astonishingly fruitful aided much by its internal warmth the middle region is woody and all the top part is extremely desolate being covered with perpetual snow out of the midst of which at the central point continually issues smoke or flame very dreadful eruptions of burning lava have issued from hence which has at times descended to the bottom of the mountain and greatly damaged the city of catania pouring in like a huge mass of melted iron among the houses crushing and burning wherever it came the internal convulsions of the mountain occasion likewise very violent earthquakes which shake various parts of the island and overthrow cities messina was greatly damaged by one a few years ago travellers sometimes penetrate to the top and are repaid with one of the grandest and most extensive prospects in the world a sight which at sunrise is sublime beyond description thirty five scylla where the island of sicily almost joins the continent are two remarkable places which were dreadful to the mariners of former days though our present skill in navigation enables us to avoid or overcome them one of them is called scylla it is a parcel of rocks against which the sea roars tremendously with horrid noises the ancients therefore fabled scylla as a woman whose lower part was like a fish and under water and from whose waist grew a number of barking howling heads of dogs which they said made those horrid noises and as many vessels were lost there she was said to devour all who came near her the other danger is a whirlpool called charbidus whose eddy drew in such small vessels as were anciently in use between these the passage was but narrow and the vessel which kept aloof from one was very likely to get in danger of the other thirty six the grotto de cani the lake agnano near naples is remarkable for a bubbling up of fetid air through it continually this same effluvia makes its appearance in several natural caverns around the lake one of them is called grotto de cani or the dog's grotto because it is customary to thrust one of those poor animals into the vapor in order to shew its effects he soon loses all signs of life they then cast him into the lake when the waters recover him a lighted candle plunged into this cavern is immediately extinguished snuff and all end of section thirteen
section 14 of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little terry at home travellers by isaac taylor italy two thirty seven thirty eight thirty nine eruption of mount vesuvius this mountain which stands near naples has been famous as far back as history reaches for its dreadful eruptions it always burns more or less emitting smoke or flame many times it has devastated the country around about seventy-nine years after the birth of christ it buried the beautiful city of herlaculum which has lately been discovered by digging vesuvius yes thy steepy sides are green with vine leaves gay and purple grapes between the peasant's hot dots bright the hillock's side the peasant's garden glows with autumn's pride thy sinking veils ascending still arise as if pomona would invade the skies the deep rut winds luxuriant grows among the loaded car rich tribute bears along thy barefoot maidens catch the vagrant eye of picturesque design or poetry thy clustering pines wave high their bushy tops crown the steep cliff fringe the rough ravines slopes deep sheltering in their shades the zephyrs cool lave their light wings in some translucent pool till evening dews invite and yon bright sun descend from his replescent height of noon recline still splendid on the western wave and bid the fall orbed moon as matron grave thy groves revisit cheer thy flagging flowers rich sweets exhale from thine exhausted bowers refresh thy fields exhilarate secure another day's effulgence to endure much i admire thee yet i would not live thy groves among for all thy groves could give i should distrust thee while that glimmering light played lustrous o'er thy clefted top each night i should remember what the historic page has well recorded of thy frantic rage when from thy caves ten thousand fathoms deep beneath the distant ocean where they sleep in vast laboratories chymic powers in silent preparation hatch their lowers with purpose dire each giant gas yet held in durance feeble by one spark impelled now bursting into flame with rumblings loud towards thy wide crater jostling armies crowd conflict struggling heaves the solid earth with throes pertinent till the feuds have birth then forked lightnings flash with vivid blaze the electric fury darts a thousand ways thick sulphurous clouds expand o'er all the sky darkness on noonday scowls with standard high covering heaven's azure vault the affrighted sun looks pale as ashes red as blood the moon tossed into upper air thy entrails deep from distant regions brought this zenith sweep stones metals melted cinders waters mixed shower over realms afar or ponderous fixed a lava boiling o'er a burning tide from thy cracked crater bears its horrors wide 
the vineyard walls a feeble barrier yields the crackling vines the smoking blazing fields mark its slow progress now the peasant's hut illumes the track the princely mansions shut in vain their bolted doors around beneath within resistless creeps pervading death the sacred inhabitant escapes to see his all consumed and live in beggary or towards the city hastily it flows pours o'er the walls upsets whole streets in rows like rival deluge seeks the affrighted sea the green wave boils the scalded fishes flee the iron promontory cools and keeps its ill-got station in the yielding deeps thus lost for seventeen slumbering centuries famed herlurkium ruined buried lies fresh brought to light like jewel kept with care thy houses prisons streets again laid bare present the antique to curiosity better than books the things themselves we see statues and pictures temples idol gods the very ruts of wheels in stone paved roads see yes that skeleton in fetters bound was forced to stay while all were fleeing round sudden his glimmering light obscured then dark for ever dark his dungeon did he hark for some intelligence to tell him why or wanted footsteps bring food his cry no ear can reach no voice of friendly tone attempts to soothe him or could reach his own ah better they the thousands who were slain in one quick moment on the sulphurous plain o'erwhelmed unsensed they yield their easy breath he lingering slowly sips the dregs of death but why at roman idol gods a sneer behold a worse idolry appear when to a sapless skull men look and pray to keep thy encroaching lava far away the insulate lava hears not fears not flows hissing reproof burns buries overthrows the weary monks retire to other ground then ply st Janurus round and round and when the lava stops as stop it must the silly people praise their saint and trust forgetting god whose mercy saves alone they trust a man a dead man's rotten bone may god forgive the stupid wicked deed send them the bible there and bid them read the papists pretend they have the head of a man they call saint generous who can stop the burning lava they do not choose to stand too long to try but retire and retire again till the lava cools enough to stop of itself then they say their saint has done it and the poor people who cannot read believe them End of section 14section number 15 of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travelers by isaac taylor italy three forty finding romulus and remus from what small beginnings do great things sometimes arise rome that grand city that vast empire whose wars and manners 
and arts and writers have filled the pages of history for ages once did not exist but owed its tiny beginning to a tiny little boy it is said that a shepherd discovered a wolf suckling a couple of young children he was much surprised and took the babes home to his wife the two boys grew one was called romulus and the other remus when come to manhood they evinced a noble spirit distinguished themselves among their neighbors in hunting the wild beasts which destroyed their flocks and thus became leaders in such enterprises from destroying beasts they rose to resisting robbers and being clever bold and successful many young men joined them they at last built a town and invited inhabitants the brothers both wished to rule a quarrel about the place for the city ended in the death of remus romulus therefore became sole king and from him the new city was called rome oh dear mamma i wish i was a king how i should like to sit upon a throne i would be such a wondrous clever thing to rule and have a city of my own that you may do my boy and shed no blood nor quarrel with your neighbors for the thing rule your own self govern your life be good that is your kingdom then yourself a king forty one modern rome romulus would not know his own city were he to rise from the grave and behold it at first it was only a parcel of huts it rose in time to be full of grand buildings temples to the gods theatres baths and palaces these are chiefly mouldering to ruins pagan rome is gone but a power as domineering has by degrees risen in this imperial city the bishop of rome or pope as he is called claiming spiritual rule over the hearts and lives and consciousnesses of men this has been exercised in a manner most dreadful by shutting out men from the scriptures by turning men's attention from jesus christ the only saviour to saints and angels and bishops and priests and beads and crucifixes and wafers and especially by persecuting to death all those who would not submit to such absurdities rome is still a large city it has in it many churches and other grand buildings st peter's church stands eminent like our st paul's at london forty two Colosseum. this is one of the finest remains of the architecture of ancient rome it is a vast oval amphitheatre built to accommodate the roman people with the shows of which they were so fond twelve thousand jewish captives were employed by vespasian in building it in the middle was a large open area where battles of men and wild beasts took place to amuse the brutal people seats are all around it rising one above another to the top it would seat eighty seven thousand and twenty thousand more could stand in it where are the myriads who thy crowded side studded with heads successive ages pride monarchs and common men and beauties fair bodies and souls religion tell me where end of section fifteen section sixteen of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little terry at home travellers by isaac taylor italy four the arch of titus titus was a roman emperor who commanded the armies which besieged the rebellious jews 
and finally destroyed the city of jerusalem he brought the spoils of the temple to rome and to perpetuate his victory this arch was built on the inside of which was sculptured the instruments of jewish worship as borne before him in his triumphant entry into rome it still remains though in decay ah poor jerusalem of cities queen when once thine one jehovah sheltered thee where white-robed priests in holy portals seen thine offering slew in grand solemnity what ails thee now demolished captive led thy sons dispersed abroad all under heaven yet still preserved distinct more easy made a mark to scorn and foul oppression given ill-fated tribes who with one voice refuse god's own messiah dying to redeem as prince exalted now his power he shows he can destroy the souls that spurn at him but he has power to save and well can bring his promise of restoring love to bear beneath this trophied arch ye then may sing worship more pure and liberty more fair the leaning tower of pisa pisa is an ancient large and handsome city of Etruria. the town is situated on the river arno ten miles distant from the sea and in a very fertile plain the river runs through pisa and over it are three bridges the middle one is constructed of marble the cathedral is a magnificent structure the doors are bronze said to be brought from jerusalem on the right side of the choir is the leaning tower which people show as a curiosity it consists of seven stories in all one hundred thirty eight feet in height and leans on one side fifteen feet and although there is no danger of its falling yet the appearance is so frightful as to prevent most persons from going near it the pizans were formerly a free and commercial people they maintained a long and severe war against the florentines who at last subdued them venice venice is remarkable as being a city in the sea it is built on a cluster of seventy-two islands there is scarcely a street in it here and there we find a little broad place or square but all the intercourse is by boats which they call gondolas there are nearly five hundred bridges one called the rialto is a very fine one it is covered over and forms a sort of exchange where the merchants meet venice arose first from a few persons settling on one of those swampy islands taking refuge from the wars which desolated italy they were of necessity obliged to fish for their sustenance and to become mariners their safety brought many to join them their boats and shipping became more and more important they traded trade brings money and money is power so that at last they became formidable kept several states in awe obtained some footing on the neighboring coast and at one time ruled the mediterranean sea the convulsions of europe have reduced venice it is now only a city belonging to the emperor of austria yes industry and care make riches flow would you be rich then try and you may grow but riches lead to luxury and pride and plunge in vices like a whelming tide venice from nothing into splendor rose her carnival the evil issue shows end of section sixteen section seventeen of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor switzerland forty six swiss peasants switzerland consists of a cluster of mountains called the alps some of them very high covering the north of italy towards germany and france mountains of course have valleys between them these valleys afford rich produce to cultivation and these mountains give pasture to cattle in time of peace and what is perhaps more important afford to the inhabitants shelter and fastnesses for defence in time of war which has made it impossible to subdue them all people inhabiting mountains are more or less free on this account 
less liable to be disturbed they have a noble simplicity of character peace and rural competence with the frankness which liberty and independence give mark the swiss and form a charm which greatly interests the strangers who visit them rural scenery and natural pleasures usually have powerful and lasting influence on the heart the swiss are so much attached to their native country that a certain song called rans de vache sung by the cowherds affects them so when in a foreign land that they must return home or pine away and die it is thus oh when shall i return to stay with all i love now far away our brook so clear our hamlets dear our cots so nigh our mountains high and sweeter still than mount or dell the ever gentle isabel beneath the elm in verdant mead dance to the shepherd's rural reed oh when shall i return to stay with all i love now far away my father mother i'll caress my sister brother fondly press while lambkins play and cattle stray and smiles my lovely shepherdess forty seven william tell switzerland has been held as part of the emperor's dominions but his governors treating the switzers with cruel oppression it occasioned at last a revolt and they delivered themselves from the german yoke it was during their oppression that gressler their governor in his wantonness of tyranny set his hat upon a pole and commanded every one who passed it to bow as if himself was there william tell disdained such crouching and was condemned to shoot with his bow at an apple placed on the head of his own son he split the apple without injuring his child being asked how he came to have two arrows he bluntly answered if the first had hit my son the second should have found your heart he was imprisoned for this but escaped and with a few others formed a plan for delivering his country which succeeded forty eight the avalanche or mountain snowball the tops of the alpine mountains are constantly covered with snow it sometimes happens that a portion of this frozen snow becomes loosened and comes rolling down from a great height it gathers in its course and becomes at last so large as to cover and destroy houses or even a whole village some of the valleys are full of ice which is never wholly melted these are called glaciers and have the appearance of solid waves as if a stormy sea had been suddenly frozen end of section seventeen section eighteen of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor hungary forty nine hungarians hungary is a distinct kingdom governed by the emperor of austria the people are considerably distinct also having dress manners and customs unlike other nations they are a hardy race warlike generous and noble in their attachment to their princes though greatly jealous of their liberties the men shave their beards but leave their whiskers their weapons are a pole-axe and a broad sword besides firearms they wear a cloak which fastens so as to leave their right hand at liberty fifty gypsies the gypsies are a wonderful people said to have their name as coming out of egypt but there is reason to think their origin should be carried farther eastward even to india these people are found in every country in europe a wandering houseless tribe who have no settled abode nor form of religion nor mode of subsistence nor connection with the people among whom they dwell though they are found in england and in all parts of europe yet they abound especially in hungary fifty one bridge of boats the danube is a noble river running through hungary across it the romans once built a bridge thought to be the grandest in the world that is in ruins but there is one now in use composed of boats which rise and fall with the water it is almost half a mile long 
stiffly like a bridge of stone many stem the torrent's roar till in tempest overthrown they can stand the shock no more tis wise like bridge of boats to rise and fall oft yielding something safety gives to all End of section 18section nineteen of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor austria fifty two the postilion the austrian dominion spread all across the southern parts of germany as the prussian monopolized the north now you must not be in a hurry for a german postilion is to a proverb the slowest and most tiresome animal in the world you may hurry yourself but you cannot hurry him his yellow jacket with black cuffs and cape mark him as belonging to government his carriage is a heavy thing and very filthy and his horses are poor he is no servant of the public but of the postmaster he cares nothing for the travellers or for their concerns they cannot help themselves by going to another inn if you threaten him he cares not if you coax him he stirs not off his usual pace if you promise him drink money he cries yaw yaw and smokes his pipe if the day is ever so hot or if every whiff flies full in your face fifty three the prater this is a forest in the neighbourhood of vienna ornamented curiously and filled full of houses of entertainment of every sort in the different styles of england turkey italy and china rope dancers dealers in toys and in every species of amusement make it one continual fair throughout shady walks invite parties splendid carriages fill all the roads so that the whole seems like an enchanted forest let me wander let me rove through this charming lively grove plunge into its deepest shades bound along its verdant glades rest me neath the shady tree its bent root a seat for me solitary let me muse on the ever varying views or by mingling in the crowd find his folly to be proud when the titled count and peer jostle with the vulgar here bring the music let it wind softly while the fearful hind listens greedy of delight nearer draws till all in sight comes she takes her frolic stand boldly feeding from the hand see the glimmering sun declines tween the boughs a red beam shines now he splendid sinks and seems to fire the danube with his beams let the moonbeam lightly play tipping every leafy spray now no longer careless roam sweet her light to guide us home in the praetor's varied way thus i spend a holiday but a life so no i scorn i for nobler ends was born satisfaction can't be found thus in pleasures ceaseless round fifty four vienna as the emperor of austria is the greatest prince in germany and vienna is his residence this gives the city a preeminence and it ranks as the capital of the empire it is not very large being confined by strong fortifications and as no buildings outside the city can be placed near these there is a broad space between the city and suburbs which renders the whole both beautiful and healthy it stands where the river vienne joins the broad danube the streets are very narrow the second floor in every house belongs to the emperor in which therefore he places some officer unless the citizens at a high price purchase an exemption from such inmates iron bars are put to all the windows which gives to every house the appearance of a prison there are many grand buildings and noble institutions the emperors omitting nothing which can give importance to their principal city end of section nineteen section twenty of 
Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Scenes in Europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor chapter twenty poland number fifty five polish gentlemen city of krakow poor poland it was once a country and had a government and a king of its own but three of its great neighbors thought they should like it for themselves so they agreed together and took each a share who was to help the poor people it cost a great deal of fighting and bloodshed but what do kings and emperors care for that well i had rather have a little honestly gotten than a kingdom so yet it is a pity for they seem to be a worthy people their nobles indeed love a great deal of pomp and the common people are all vassals slaves to their lords so that i should not much like to live there i'd rather be in england the poles shave their heads all but a tuft on the crown and wear great whiskers a fur cap a long vest with a gown or a short cloak over it give them a noble appearance that is the gentry for the common people wear a thick coarse cloth or in winter a sheepskin with the wool inwards fifty six the wild child in the vast forests which cover many parts of poland and germany are found children quite wild as the beasts among whom they have lived these must have been dropped by their mothers in the frequent inroads made by barbarous nations peter the wild boy as he was called was found there in the time of george i he was brought over to england and lived to be above eighty when found he lived on leaves grass and berries he could not speak nor could they ever teach him above a few words poor outcast orphan thou hast never known a father's shelter o'er thy houseless head nor mother's care with fond affection's tone soothed thy young griefs or smoothed thy infant bed thy nurse perchance the wild sow savage foul bid grunting pigs thyself as sordid seas or wolf bereaved of young with hideous howl welcome thy lips her stiffening dogs to ease that stare unmeaning tells a tale of woe thou hadst no teaching smile thy smiles to mould no fond caress bade thy caresses glow thy pliant heart's warm feelings to unfold what muttering noises clatter o'er thy tongue ne'er bid to cry mamma by a well-loved voice wooed to say pray or ta while fondly clung on her fair bosom flushed with mutual joys not speak but never call to playmates dear nor hold sweet dialogue with brother boy nor lead thy sister hush her infant fear alas thy only self was all thy joy true thou canst run by beast pursuing taught and climb like squirrel over the tree-top moss thy haggard limbs are active thou hast caught some excellence sad excellence by loss tis melancholy e'en thy mirth to see irrational disgusting sensual low yet let it rouse deep gratitude in me what contrast mercies o'er my bosom flow my infant days were watched with tender care instructions kindest form allured my mind thanks to my parents teachers each their share to heaven my feelings point by heaven refined fifty seven inflammable springs there are many remarkable mines and springs in poland the virtues of one particular spring are said to assist life many persons of one hundred years old constantly drink them they seem to be impregnated with some peculiar vapor as a flame bursts forth if a lighted torch is applied and dances on the surface near krakow the capital city 
they dig salt out of the earth from the depth of several hundred yards i shall give you a short description of the manner of descending into them when the person reaches the mouth of the mine he is seated upon hammocks fastened in a circle round the great rope that is used in drawing up the salt and is gently let down one hundred and sixty yards below the first layer of salt here he is furnished with a light the reflection of which on the glittering sides of the mine is extremely beautiful he now proceeds on foot gradually descending through broad passages and at other times down steps cut in the solid salt which being almost as hard as stone the miners hew it with a pickaxe into large blocks of six or seven hundred pounds each they have hollowed out a chapel in which they assemble at mass the altar crucifix ornaments of the chapel and statues of several saints are all of the same material end of section twenty recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section twenty one of scenes in europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor chapter twenty one germany one fifty eight hunting the wild boar germany consists of many states differing in government religion and manners the king of prussia rules most of the northern provinces as the emperor of austria governs the southern in the western part are some independent states the people of germany in general are remarkable for industry their application to whatever art they adopt is wonderful and their success almost certain watches were first invented by them and were called nuremberg eggs dull plodding are not terms of disgrace when they mean a patient pursuit of art or science that determines to catch it their dress resembles much the english though in some places rich furs and diamonds are used by the wealthy the lower classes are little better than slaves to the rich landholders and the women laborious servants to their husbands the baron the prince the nobles of germany are much addicted to field sports among which is preeminent hunting the wild boar in the black forest and in many other vast woods wild swine are common and often very detrimental to the peasantry to rout these from their hiding places and to kill them is the sport and the profit of many westphalia hams so much esteemed are thus obtained fifty nine timber floats one of the most remarkable things on the rhine the river which runs between france and germany is the raft of whole timbers which floats down the stream for sale in holland these rafts consist of trees cut in such forests as can reach the river in small parcels they pass the difficult places and are then united often to the length of a thousand feet and eighty or ninety wide and so deep as to float seven feet above the water the trees many of them seventy feet long are well fastened to each other with iron spikes and cross timbers till the whole is one firm compact body like a floating island with a village covering the top for it requires nearly five hundred laborers to manage it while it swims down the river two rows of huts are built upon it forming a street between them with larger huts for the kitchen and the captain's dwelling so that it looks all alive a vast quantity of provisions they carry with them to feed so many men several weeks till they get to dort which is one of the towns where they break up their whole mass and sell it 
sometimes to the value of thirty thousand pounds when it moves a number of smaller rafts which are fastened to it in front go first with small boats to guide it then every laborer sits in his place on a bench to manage the oars rowing with all his might as directed by the captain and other officers before they actually move when all the men are at their several places the pilot takes off his hat and calls out let us pray in an instant the whole party are on their knees asking the blessing of god on their voyage they have many anchors with which they fasten the whole raft to the shore when they want to stop sixty fall of the rhine queen of germanic floods whose silver stream from christen alps rises in double fount where baby switzers fording barefoot seem of thy young honours to make small account how bursts thy wave indignant my dear groan where famed schaffhausen spans thy wave with pride from yon high ledge of rocks impetuous thrown deep foaming bellowing headlong plunging tide the storm of passion o'er the vale attained grown gentler unopposed thy lovely course mid hamlets wander slow as if detained by glens and forests with attractive force yet urged by stores accumulated deep commerce delighted claims thy friendly aid proud cities rise and every bending sweep Strasbourg and Worms, Mentz, Cologne, rich in trade. Hail, beauteous flood, like life thy course appears, as infant simple, rash in youth, then grown, rich and mature, at last, like hoary years, lost, sunk, neglected, name and honors gone. End of section twenty one. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section twenty two of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org recording by greg giordano scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor chapter twenty two germany two sixty one aix la chapelle germany abounds with mineral waters these are springs whose reservoirs are deep in the mountains and becoming by that means impregnated with the various saline and metallic substances they are in fact medicines ready prepared by nature and of considerable power in most places where invalids crowd for the purpose of drinking these waters or of bathing in them there is also a resort of fashionable company whose only object is to share in the amusements which are provided in plenty during the proper season. Baden, near Vienna, is very famous. Also Spa, in Piermont, and those of Aix-la-Chapelle, all in Westphalia, are perhaps the most resorted to. Invalids in crowds repair, where the healing waters flow. Drink the potent medicine there, bathe their limbs, and lose their woe come then sick and lame and fearful drink be well and strong and cheerful sixty two german peasantry there are parts of germany where industry is scarcely known luxury and idleness mark the higher ranks while poverty dirtiness and incivility give a disgusting character to the lower orders whose hut is that how miserable it looks the boards are fastened together with pack-thread instead of nails the roof is broken in and there are great holes in the wall i am sure idleness dwells here 
for however poor the inhabitants they should have some regard for cleanliness sixty three berlin berlin is the capital of the prussian dominions where the king resides it has been suddenly and lately raised to considerable beauty all that is new being built on a regular plan there are many great palaces in it handsome squares and churches but the outside often seems better in appearance than the inside feels in accommodation and furniture frederick the third who was a great warrior and who of course successfully robbed all his neighbors raised prussia to its present elevation greatly by his military discipline when told of the balloons then newly invented in france he replied the french in balloons as their own claim the air the english will domineer over the sea the land russia has nor a morsel can spare then fire there is nothing but fire left for me end of section twenty two recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section twenty three of Scenes in Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by greg giordano scenes in europe for the amusement and instruction of little tarry at home travellers by isaac taylor chapter twenty three denmark sixty four copenhagen denmark is only a small tongue of land projecting from the north of germany into the sea yet has it been very powerful reigning over Norway also, and Sweden. From thence poured forth great numbers, whose incessant attacks upon England obtained more or less dominion over it for two hundred years, especially in the time of Alfred, and under Canute. Of late years, the despotism of the court has produced much misery among the people. The dominions of the King of Denmark dip a little into Germany, but the seat of government is at Copenhagen, a beautiful city, built with regularity and some splendor. It has during the last war been brought into notice by the attacks made on it, twice by the English, who brought away all their shipping, to prevent their joining the French. Denmark itself presents but few curiosities, unless we mention the village of Anglin, near Sleswick, from whence came the Angles, or Saxons so called, who by settling in Britain gave names to several kingdoms, which at last issued in England, or Angle land. 65. Danish Watchman. It is a custom worth our notice that the Danish watchman, as he goes his rounds at bedtime, stops occasionally and puts up a prayer to God to preserve the city from fire. He also warns the inhabitants to be careful of their candles. This is quite right, to join prayer to God with our own carefulness, and our own carefulness with prayer to God. Father, whose all-seeing eye pierces darkness as the day, safe within thy care I lie, hear me when I humbly pray. Thee I own thy guardian power, keeps when sleep my sense in chains, guards from harm in midnight hour, murderous hands or feverish veins, guards from smouldering blazing fire, how beyond my utmost care, though I see each spark expire, still I trust to thee by prayer. 66. The Blind Workman It is a great mercy to have all our senses preserved, especially our eyesight those who see are apt to forget its value however when persons have been deprived of sight a vigorous mind will act and sometimes in a way which quite surprises us there is in the royal museum in copenhagen a cabinet 
curiously constructed of ivory and ebony by a man who was entirely blind let no one who has the use of his eyes say i can't do it when such admirable things have been done by persons laboring under blindness many instances have been known of blind persons who have excelled in various arts in music frequently the blind fiddler is often seen mr stanley a famous organist was blind mr sanderson who read lectures in astronomy and mathematics at cambridge lost his sight when about three years old yet was one of the best lecturers of his time our great poet milton is another instance though he did not lose his sight till late in life there are persons who undertake to teach the blind even to write and in many things to gain a livelihood a noble charity assisting and supporting a helpless and pitiable sort of people if the blind can excel me it sure is a shame but none shall e'er tell me that thus i am to blame my eyes i will use em and mind all i see nor idle abuse em as useless to me what work can i do now like that poor blind man i've nothing to show now but will if i can i ought to be learning so good are my eyes i then may be earning my daily supplies though now my good father provides for my need i'm sure i should rather be useful indeed end of section twenty three recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida